<coughs> good morning, everyone. <coughs> good morning, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming here. We are delighted to have you here at Princeton. Uh, this uh, conference is being hosted by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. Uh, so just a quick introduction on the center. Uh, the center was established in 2011 in the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, and the purpose of the uh, center is to study the link uh, between finance and macro, uh, especially as it uh, relates to issues uh, of uh, public policy importance. And uh, uh, we are delighted to host this third annual conference um, uh, run by this uh, center. Uh, the center, by the way, is uh, co-directed uh, by Marcus Brunemeyer, who is sitting right over there. Uh, the first session, all of you have the schedule for the conference, the first session will be on consumption and credit. So let me introduce the chair of uh, the, our first session, which will be uh, Angus Deaton from uh, Princeton. Angus is the Dwight Eisenhower Professor of Economics and International Affairs at Woodrow Wilson School and uh, the Economics uh, Department. He um, has a very wide range of interests and uh, one of the thought leaders in, in many different areas. And you can guess the scope and uh, expertise of his talents by just uh, looking at the title of his uh, uh, just uh, uh, recent book, which is The Great Escape, Health, Wealth, and the Origins of Inequality. Uh, and uh, he could have written a few more books on different topics, uh, and he would have been the expert on those as well, including the, 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 the session that he is heading, which is on consumption and credit spearheaded by some of uh, Deaton's own path-breaking work. So uh, really, I would like to welcome all of you once again. And uh, now I give the chair to Angus, who will uh, lead the session. Just so that everyone knows, each uh, paper or each author, uh, they have uh, 25 minutes. And then after that, we'll have about 20 minutes of discussion. So there is no formal discussion. It's open. Um, uh, discussion back and forth, and uh, then we'll move on to the next paper. Thank you very much. I'm not going to stay up here very long so that um, I can actually see the screen along with everyone else. And it's a great pleasure to, I guess, no needs for introduction, but to say hello to Chris Carroll and to start off with the first paper. So in 25 minutes, I will come up here and handle the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, um, I should point out that uh, my affiliation um, has temporarily changed. I'm uh, now the um, uh, at the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, which um, is a, something that happened since uh, I wrote these slides and since I was invited uh, to this conference. And for uh, those of you who don't know, um, the CFPB was created by the Dodd-Frank Act um, and it, it, to, to sort of uh, monitor and um, police the uh, interactions between the um, financial sector and, um, and consumers. The, um, and so it's sort of a government startup. And so I like to say I'm the chief economist and assistant director of an oxymoron. Um, <coughs> I, I mention this also because um, I, I wanted to very briefly uh, respond to an excellent question that someone asked uh, Alan Kruger last night. Um, uh, one of the uh, members of the audience said, um, are there ways in which government data um, uh, kind of failed us in the um, Great Recession and, and could be improved? And, Alan's answer was sort of, well, the BEA does a pretty good job in trying to measure the things that, it, that it's trying to measure. But a different uh, kind of answer would have been to ask whether there are things that could be measured now and would be useful to measure now, uh, but we're not uh, measuring. And uh, there, I think, the, the answer is there are a, a lot of such things. Um, and uh, I hope that... Um, at CFPB, we will be in the forefront of measuring uh, such things. Uh, one very brief example before I move on to my paper is that I think a paper like this one um, could be much better done if we had um, the appropriate kinds of data at um, much finer geographical levels than the entire country all at once. Um, in particular, uh, high-quality data on spending dynamics uh, as 
uh, Amir and Atif ha have uh, have discovered, you can piece together bits and uh, bits and parts of that um, using uh, uh, sources that you find in the wild, so to speak. Um, but um, if we had high quality, regularly produced data uh, on spending um, at local areas, um, there's an enormous amount of great research that could be done. And I hope we may be able to produce such data. So after um, that advertisement for um, the CFPB, let me um, uh, plunge into the paper. Um, the uh, personal saving rate, um, as it was measured at the time that this paper's draft um, that you see here was written, looked like this. Um, Alan pointed out that the 2013 comprehensive revisions um, tilted it a little bit. Um, I, uh, will hasten to say that my uh, co-authors have redone all of the analysis in the paper and uh, nothing much changes when we use the comprehensive, uh, the newly revised uh, data. So I'll leave that issue aside. What the paper is about is trying to quantify the um, different influences on the saving rate that um, Alan was talking about last, last night. Um, the influences on um, uh, the, the, that come from the, the sort of traditional uh, Modigliani, Klein, life cycle, wealth effects kinds of things uh, uh, have been talked about for decades. Um, in some early work uh, of mine, I argued that there was a lot of reason to think that much of what happens to the saving rate over the business cycle reflects precautionary motives that were left out of the, um, the, the sort of life cycle uh, analysis. Uh, and then, of course, there has been a, a good bit of literature arguing that, um, that the availability of credit has a big effect on uh, the saving rate, uh, both on the secular trend. Uh, Jonathan Parker and uh, a bunch of other people uh, have argued that um, the saving behavior over time has a lot to do with availability of credit. And then uh, more recently, um, a, a lot of analysis of the Great Recession has uh, focused on the extent to which uh, a, a sharp decline in credit availability might be responsible for a good part of the decline in the sharp uh, decline in consumption spending. Um, so the point, the purpose of this paper here is to try to put some rough uh, magnitudes on these um, different uh, influences that have been kind of separately examined in the literature. Um, and it's an important question because the saving rate increased by, uh, you know, about four percentage points roughly um, from, from uh, over a pretty short period of time. And remember, this is the saving rate. So it, it, when I say the, the saving rate increased by four percentage points, that means that spending fell by four percentage points more than income fell, and income, you know, really fell uh, in the Great Recession. So um, uh, Alan um, talked about it in terms of the weakness of consumption, but uh, the weakness of consumption, it was weak compared to income, which was also weak. Um, but you can't really figure out just from that set of facts um, whether uh, the, the, the relative contribution of uh, credit contribution, credit conditionings having tightened, uh, unemployment expectations having risen, uh, or um, uh, the, the big collapse in wealth um, that uh, we saw at the same time. Um, here, here's just a graph of the personal saving rate uh, compared uh, with the envelope of all previous uh, post-war recessions, the envelope being the, the sort of gray area, the, the maximum change and the, the minimum change. And as you can see, the, the size of the increase in the saving rate, it typically increases, but the size of the increase this, this time was uh, really completely unprecedented. Um, so um, what do we do? Well, we, we start with just sort of sketching a, a simple and, and by now fairly uh, familiar uh, model that has a reasonably transparent role where you can see exactly how uh, wealth effects or credit effects or precautionary effects would uh, would work out. Um, as sort of a, a side point, uh, one of the interesting implications of that model is that um, if movements in the saving rate are the result of uh, 
uh, of changes in the, the degree of uncertainty, um, you, could, you can get sort of an overshooting phenomenon where the saving rate uh, goes up more in the short run or cons consumption collapses more in the short run than um, the, will then it will be the ultimate um, adjustment that it has to make, even if the adjustment is permanent. And um, the, the fact that such an overshooting is an implication of um, these kinds of models um, m means that there can be a role uh, for fiscal policy in, in trying to sort of moderate the collapse that, would, that comes from those sorts of things. But that's a bit of a side note um, for today's purposes. So we, we sketch the theory. We um, then um, look at the available evidence um, to try to quantify those three channels that I mentioned before using um, both just a simple uh, reduced form uh, estimation of, uh, of the um, something that comes out of the model and then uh, something that's a bit fancier uh, and more structural. Uh, and what we, to preview the conclusions, um, the the model suggests that the secular decline um, that is over the long time frame since 1966 that our data covers um, is almost all a consequence of the increased availability of credit. It, the saving rate fell because it became a lot easier to borrow, um, according to the, um, to the model. Um, but the cyclical movements in the saving rate, um, what happens, you know, uh, in a recession when the saving rate goes up uh, quickly. Those, uh, according to the estimates, um, mostly reflect the fluctuations in uh, wealth and the fluctuations in, I'm using this uh, fancy upside down omega, uh, it's called Mo, um, because it sort of looks like a U and it's about the unemployment rate uh, and so you can remember what it is. And I've used up all the other Greek letters so uh, I, needed, uh, <laughs> I needed an extra one. Uh, so unemployment expectations is what you should think when you see that um, you looking thing. Um, so um, now this is not to say that uh, the, the, that the availability of credit uh, doesn't have a very large effect uh, on business cycle movements in the saving rate uh, because to the extent that movements in credit affect uh, either wealth or um, unemployment expectations, uh, the, that kind of causality from credit to um, those two variables uh, could be quite important. Um, but I, I think uh, what our evidence suggests is that the direct effect of credit in um, uh, moving consumption around uh, over the business cycle um, isn't uh, so large. Um, the, the model is, you know, this pretty much the simplest possible uh, model for illustrating um, the, the mechanics of the three uh, channels. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, just a standard um, optimal consumption with CRRA utility um, where there is actually an analytical solution for the target level of wealth. Uh, and uh, the target level of wealth, it exists, it's stable, uh, and the behavior of consumption is chosen over time in such a way that your actual market resources, M, will move towards um, a target uh, level of market resources. Um, the, um, the target level of wealth, in turn, uh, we have a closed form solution for that, and it depends in the ways that you might expect on the things that you might expect it to depend upon. Um, so if unemployment expectations uh, are higher, then you're going to want to have a larger buffer uh, level of wealth. Uh, if unemployment insurance generosity goes down uh, then, or, or, or goes up, let's say unemployment insurance generosity goes up, then you don't need as large a buffer. That's what the um, Xi Soup U is. It's sort of the generosity of the unemployment insurance system. And, you know, preferences work in the way that you would expect. Uh, if you're more impatient, then you have a lower target and, uh, and so on. Um, so here's an illustration of um, how the model works and what it says. Um, if we started off at a target level of uh, wealth, uh, the M 
the, the sort of check mark over it is pointing down to the M variable, and it's pointing to it because it's tell, indicating it's the target value. So if we started at the target value, and then we got a wealth shock, um, well, the, the, the concave function that you see there is the optimal level of spending for a given level of um, market wealth. And um, so we move, of course, to the appropriate lower level of consumption. Uh, the, the shock that we're analyzing here happens in time t. And uh, so consumption goes to Ct. And then because consumption is less than uh, income, um, uh, the, the sustainable level of consumption is indicated by the delta m uh, curve. So that's how much you could, if you consumed that amount, then you would leave your wealth constant. Since you're consuming less than that, your wealth will be rising over time uh, towards uh, the target, um, and you eventually would get back to the target. Um, so this sort of is the, the way the model captures the old style, you know, wealth effects that were emphasized in the Modigliani, Klein, et cetera, uh, literature. Here's what happens if you had um, a permanent increase in unemployment expectations. Uh, the consumption function sort of uh, twists around. It, it, it rotates uh, in a uh, clockwise direction, uh, which means that, of course, if you started at the target level of wealth, then the level of consumption would drop. Um, and uh, since that's now less than the sustainable level of consumption, uh, wealth will subsequently rise over time towards a new target, uh, which is a higher uh, target level. Um, and as I mentioned in the introduction, um, an implication of that increase in unemployment expectations is that, uh, first of all, there is going to be a higher uh, steady state saving rate. If the rise in unemployment expectations is permanent, you want to have a, a permanently higher target level of wealth. But in the short run, uh, you get um, this overshooting uh, phenomenon uh, where consumption drops even more, the saving rate rises even more, um, and uh, that could provide uh, a rationale for some uh, countercyclical stabilization policy. Um, but I will uh, not emphasize that uh, point today. Um, the, the final kind of experiment that you um, uh, uh, want to be able to analyze in this context is what happens if uh, there is a change in the availability of credit. So here uh, we go from sort of the, a, an extreme version in which um, the structure of the model says that the, essentially there will not be any borrowing at all to a, um, a, a, an increased generosity of the unemployment insurance system which makes people willing to borrow and desire to borrow. And um, that is effectively the same thing as a, a relaxation of credit constraints. So uh, what happens is what you would expect to happen. The, the consumption function shifts to the left. And um, in, with the new consumption rule, if you were at your original target, then um, your new level of consumption that you can uh, uh, that you'll be happy to undertake, it goes way up, and so you have a spending spree. Uh, and then gradually over time, you run your wealth down to the um, new target, which is uh, lower, because with extra credit availability, you don't need to maintain such a uh, large buffer. Um, so those are the, the, the sort of intuition, the mechanisms of how things work in the model. Um, now I want to show sort of the uh, movements of the underlying uh, variables that are the key ones um, uh, according to the model. Um, this is the ratio of net worth to um, disposable income. Um, and uh, as we can all see, there was a big collapse in net worth uh, from the, uh, is there a laser pointer here? Oh, here. Well, here's something. No, that's, yay. Okay. So there was a big collapse, a uh, huge decline in the wealth to income ratio from the um, peak right before the Great Recession uh, down to the end of it. Um, and, you know, typically wealth declines around um, uh, the times of recessions. Uh, here is our measure of credit uh, availability, uh, which builds on some work by uh, John Mulebauer. Um, it uses the Federal Reserve's survey of senior loan officers, which is uh, increasingly becoming 
uh, a standard m way of measuring supply as distinct from de demand of credit. As everyone who has thought about it much realizes, it is very difficult to um, come up with a compelling measure of the supply and is distinct from the demand of credit. But uh, this is has the virtue of being transparent and of uh, sort of passing a lot of sniff tests for a good measure of the supply uh, of credit. Um, we're following Muehlbauer's method of just you sort of accumulate the thing over time to um, produce a measure of the level of credit availability. Um, and indeed, uh, Credit uh, declined uh, substantially. Credit availability, according to this measure, declined substantially in the Great Recession, much more than in most uh, previous um, cyclical episodes. Um, and then finally, we uh, have this measure of unemployment uh, expectations, uh, which is constructed from a Com combining a, the Michigan survey of consumers in which people are just asked, do you expect the unemployment rate to go up uh, over the next year? Um, can we combine that with the level of the unemployment rate um, and produce a proxy for the unemployment expectations variable uh, that appears in the model? So what do we get? Um, the sort of bottom line is that when we estimate um, this model that includes just those three factors. Uh, we do really remarkably well. Uh, well, how much the word remarkably is justified uh, might be something that um, t people could differ upon, but um, the R squared of the regression is 0.9. Um, the variables are all extremely highly statistically significant. Um, and it is not just because um, we're regressing trends on trends. We have done all of the uh, um, methodologically approved tests for um, spurious regressions and uh, we pass all these things. Um, um, so all three variables sort of have the influence in the direction that you would expect uh, and uh, look highly statistically significant. Um, this is, um, I, I think, maybe a at least as useful way of uh, seeing what the bottom line looks like. Uh, it shows um, the, the data for the saving rate, which is the, the black line, against what the model um, says uh, the saving rate would be, um, as a, you know, given the values of the predictive variables, and then plots all of those versus a time, time trend. And um, when you include the time trend in the regression, it's not statistically significant, uh, which I think um, is visually reflected here in the extent to which you can see the red line is very much moving around that time trend in the same way that the black line does. Um, so it's not just that we have some uh, variable that trends down, uh, trends over time and we're regressing another one that trends over time uh, on it. Um, this is just some robustness stuff where we throw in a, a bunch of typical variables that people uh, often look at and we're testing for stability of the coefficients uh, and things like that. For, for example, this is what happens if we re-estimate the model just on the data after 1980 since the, uh, we cite a fairly extensive literature that says um, the, the, that the period of financial liberalization, uh, s uh, very substantial financial liberalization over time started around 1980. You might think the period before 1980 and the period after 1980 uh, could exhibit different patterns, but um, in practice they don't seem to. Um, so the results seem to be fairly stable. And as I mentioned, I think at the outset, um, uh, my co-authors have rerun everything on the newly revised uh, uh, data from the BEA in the 2013 Comprehensive Revision, and things stay pretty much the same. Um, here's what we get when we put in other controls for, you know, oil shocks and all sorts of other things that people frequently control for. So that's sort of a, the OLS uh, results. Um, we also can estimate the, the virtue of articulating a structural model like the one that we started with um, is that in principle you can estimate um, the structural parameters that um, will then let you simulate um, events that uh, you don't directly see in the data. Um, essentially you do that by just finding the parameter values that make the um, structural model produce 
outcomes that match the actual outcomes as well as the structural model is able uh, to do. Um, here's what the structural model fit uh, looks like. Um, and I think the bottom line um, is that it fits about as well as the um, reduced form model. And that's pretty, um, that's pretty cool, actually, because um, you know, the, the structural model imposes a lot more structure on the data. And in principle, the data might li not like that structure and might, um, might rebel. Um, but um, it, it doesn't really uh, do so. Um, OK, so, so now let's decompose. Uh, the the personal saving rate. Um, the red uh, uh, figure is what the model predicts the personal saving rate would have been. Uh, the black tells you what uh, the model says when we exclude the effects of uncertainty. And so as you can see, the effects of uncertainty are greatest um, in the recessionary periods. So. Uh, uh, there's a, you know, nearly a two percentage point increase in the saving rate here, for example, in the early 1980s, um, that reflects the high unemployment expectations in that period. And although um, the um, increase in the saving rate was quite extreme in the Great Recession, and so the, the uh, black line and the red line are a little harder to distinguish from each other here, um, the increase in unemployment expectations does account for a big part of the increase in the saving rate uh, in the Great Recession as well. Um, the, the other point here is if we exclude both the effects of uncertainty and the credit easing um, a, a variable, um, the personal saving rate basically doesn't trend much uh, over time. Uh, that is sort of an interesting point, actually, because it has often been argued that most of the um, decline in the saving rate that we have seen in the U.S. secularly just reflects an increase in the wealth to income ratio. Uh, and what uh, this would suggest is that actually, no, it, the wealth to income ratio, yes, it went up over time, but mainly the reason the saving rate has declined uh, is that uh, it has gotten easier to borrow and the increasing wealth to income ratio uh, only has a minor, uh, makes a minor contribution. Um, Here's what the structural model looks like versus the reduced form. As you can see, they're virtually indistinguishable. Um, and uh, let me uh, close with uh, calculations about uh, what the model says about the, what happened to the saving rate in the Great Recession. Um, either the reduced form model or the structural model. Uh, I, I, let's look at the reduced form just because it um, imposes, it's, it's more transparent. Um, says that um, the change in wealth in the Great Recession, this you know historic collapse in the stock market and in house prices, um, is uh, would have been large enough to increase the saving rate by about 1.6 uh, percentage points. Um, the increase in unemployment fears, the precautionary motive, uh, would have been large enough to increase the saving rate by about 1.2 percentage points. Um, and the collapse of credit um, only accounts for about 0.6 uh, percentage points. Um, so the credit availability, the direct effect of credit availability, um, seems not to have been the main driver of uh, the, the, the increase in the saving rate, at least according to these estimates. Um, so I will uh, wrap up here since my 25 minutes are uh, pretty much gone. Um, what the data suggests is that all three of the effects that the literature has uh, emphasized are present, um, and that the long-term decline in the saving rate probably uh, mostly re reflects the um, fact that it's just gotten easier and easier to borrow in the period since the financial liberalization started in the 1980s. Um, <clears throat> in, and in the Great Recession, um, the biggest um, contributor to the increase in the saving rate. Looks like it was that wealth shock. Um, but the unemployment fears uh, are also pretty large. And the direct effect of credit tightening doesn't look like it was that large. But again, I would emphasize that this is a model that essentially takes the movements of wealth and uh, of uh, unemployment fears as exogenous. And to the extent that the 
you know, real role of what happened in the financial sector was to cause wealth to collapse and to cause unemployment fears to go up. Um, the, the sort of uh, indirect effect of events in the financial sector um, could arguably be the whole story. So I will stop there. <laughs> the audience so that I can see the next. Oh, you want to sit here? We're having the discussion now. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay, the floor is open. So, uh, Chris, I just have what it looks like a puzzle to me uh, the following fact in the light of the one that we So now I'm focusing on the concern that the secular rationalization rate can be explained by these variables. So let's think of the logic of that argument. The logic of that argument is that people are saving for the cost of the more credit becomes available, and now I need to do less of that. Right? Uh, but there are two ways I can respond to that in that model. One is that now I don't need to ensure myself against the use of traffic now. Now, if that's the story, then what I should observe going forward is that sometimes some people borrow credit, but then they repay, and then some other people borrow. Right? So you're just enjoying the use of traffic now. So there's not necessarily an aggregated piece of credit in that story. Uh, the second possibility is that people are now borrowing against future permanent income because they can. You know, if their incomes were rising, they're borrowing, and so now the same group of people can systematically borrow more. So the second story can potentially explain the increase in credit in the aggregate. Now look, here's the problem. The problem is when we look at data, neither of those two things is true. So it, first of all, we know aggregate credit increased tremendously during this period at the same time. So just idiosyncratic shock explanation cannot be the right one. So then, OK, maybe the permanent income story is the right one. But again, when you look at the data, uh, the people who are systematically borrowing in the cross section, they are not the guys whose permanent income is rising over time. In fact, it's, it's the opposite in the worst time period, 2004, 2006. Um, I think what this really gets down to is this assumption in the model that everything is optimal, right? So there is no sense of overconsumption. Um, and again, there is a puzzle in the data in the cross section because when you look at the cross section of crises, um, <coughs> the increase in credit to GDP ratio predicts crises typically, right? That's <coughs> now a well, well founded, uh, a well established result. Um, but I don't think you'll have that come out of these kind of models because. You, there is no reason that credit growth per se should predict crises. Yes, given given these shocks, yeah, I understand consumption will fall and so on, but I don't think it's going to predict crises in, uh, uh, if I take these models at face value. So that's 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 my main question. Okay, so let me respond to those two points, which I think are are conceptually very different. Um, in order, the the. the um, Uh, the extent to which the behavior of people in the model is um, optimal, uh, I think, is a more interesting question than um, the profession has has typically treated it as. The behavior of the people in the model is consistent with. Um, the solution to a certain maximization problem in which you are discounting the future at a, a certain rate and you have expectations about uh, the, the future shocks. Uh, but whether the rate at which you are discounting the future is in some sense the rate at which you ought to discount the future um, is uh, practically a metaphysical question um, and is, I think, really the heart of the uh, um, uh, of the answer to whether or not you want to treat behavior um, in the model as optimal. I don't want to take a hard uh, position on that for the purposes of this paper. The model is much more kind of a framework for articulating the, the three kinds of effects that you might expect uh, to see, you know, precautionary effects, credit availability effects, wealth effects. It's much more of just sort of a 
um, a, a hat rack uh, for uh, ex discussing those uh, and, and thinking about those um, effects than it is uh, a uh, strong stance on whether people really are optimal uh, in their choices. Uh, but it is a model in which, I mean, I think the key intuition of it is people are impatient. Uh, they are impatient in the sense that if not for uh, for their fears about the future, for the, if not for their uncertainty, they would like to run their wealth down and just keep running it down and running it down. They, they prefer the present to the future um, in a way that means that whenever you have a uh, increase in the availability of credit, uh, then they're going to take advantage of it. They're going to run their wealth down more if they can, uh, if, if the, the credit is more available. Uh, and that means that you don't need to have any change in expectations about the growth rate of permanent income uh, or uh, differential change for different differential types of people in order to get uh, a, a, an increase in uh, debt. You know, you make it easier for impatient people to borrow, and they will borrow more. Um, and that's just sort of the definition, of, almost, of, of the fact that, uh, of the assumption that they're impatient. Um, so uh, the model doesn't need uh, to make any assumptions about changes in the expected growth rate of permanent income. It doesn't make any such assumptions. It, it, it says essentially just that um, the main reason that people borrowed more is because they can. Um, the financial sector made it easier, uh, and, and so people do um, do more. That's, that, that's sort of the underlying point. Um, uh, I agree that it's it's a little hard to uh, you know relate the increases in credit to changes in beliefs about uh, or into to rational changes about beliefs and ex expected future income growth, uh, which is why I just left that channel out altogether. Um, on um, crises and the vulnerability to crises, um, I have some separate work that that finds that uh, a consequence of making it easier to borrow is that an economy that uh, is in the new equilibrium in which debt is higher is an economy that will be more volatile. It will exhibit greater uh, fluctuations. Um, that's not here uh, because I wanted to have just the simple hat rack model uh, here. But uh, I am uh, I think there are a, a, a variety of reasons to think that's uh, very plausible. Um, when you have a much higher level of debt, um, then you have to basically uh, respond more dramatically when your expectations change or when the world changes, and that more dramatic response is uh, m part of the reason why the economic system maybe as a whole is more uh, vulnerable when you have higher levels of credit. Um, I think that's a very interesting set of issues, uh, but not one that uh, we really um, even try to address here. I, I think that, that, you know, one way of interpreting what we're saying in the paper is that the hardest and most important problem uh, that needs to be addressed is the relationship between credit availability and um, you know, the, the fluctuations in aggregate wealth and the fluctuations in expectations. We leave that out. We just take those fluctuations in wealth and in expectations as exogenous. Um, but they s seem to be driving the changes in, in consumption and saving. Uh, and so figuring out why wealth collapsed and figuring out why uh, uncertainty increased is, is really the heart of the matter. And I think that's right. I guess I had a more f um, fundamental question in terms of the approach. So if I look at your credit, credit uh, secular credit measure, right? you're effectively aggregating the responses from the Federal Reserve Survey of Senior Loan Officers. Mm -hmm. Are you at all concerned that that data set exhibits significant uh, survivor bias? Right? You've gone through a massive consolidation in financial institutions which by definition would mean that more aggressive financial institutions acquired other financial institutions. The aggregate line 
would be a poor proxy for a secular change in credit availability. I think um, the um, survivorship bias is uh, likely to be a problem. I think that there is a whole host of things that are um, serious problems with the um, senior loan officer survey as a measure of credit availability. Um, I think I, I, I choose that measure uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first is that there are profound uh, problems with any measure. Uh, no one has come up with a, a really persuasive measure of credit availability. We, we actually, in the appendix, present um, the only other two things that look like they are remotely useful in that context. And, they sort of seem to move roughly in similar ways to the senior loan officer survey. But um, the, it, the, the, the measuring the availability of credit is an extremely difficult um, thing to do. So, so I think it's, a, it's you know, arguably as good as anything else that's out there, I actually arguably better. But the other point is that it's uh, reasonably transparent. Um, you, you, the, the, other measures are just much more um, uh, complex and, and hard to um, disentangle and hard to understand. Um, the, the, uh, what, what there seems to be no arguing about is that uh, there was a very sustained period of financial liberalization in the U.S. starting, you know, in the late 70s or early 80s. Everyone, I mean, it's just a, you know, stone cold historical fact. Um, and uh, nobody really seems to dispute the proposition that um, banks cut back on the availability of credit uh, during the Great Recession, and they typically cut back uh, during uh, recessions. Um, so, you know, whether this measure gets that quantitatively right, um, it gets both of those two things quantitatively right is, uh, uh, who knows. When you look at the um, net worth, the net wealth issues, are you looking at balance sheet impacts? Are you saying, for example, if a person has a home, if the consumer that you're studying has a home that's mortgaged, mm -hmm. is the savings rate affected by the comfort level of the borrower, who is also a consumer, um, to get to a target level of um, of debt capacity, de you know, the debt level, so to speak. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And is it important to uh, to try to control for balance sheet effects? That is, for example, would your numbers be different if you just looked at people who didn't, who were maybe renting or actually had their home without any mortgage debt, you know, owned it, owned it uh, entirely uh, with equity. Yeah. I, I'm very sympathetic to that question, uh, but I think the, that in order to answer it properly, uh, we would need much better data um, at the microeconomic level uh, than we have. Um, the the you really need to have uh, uh, panel data on individual households over time uh, that are high quality and that extend over long periods of time and it just doesn't exist. Uh, one point to make here though is I have uh, there's there's been a bit of a literature on the magnitude of um, housing wealth effects versus the magnitude of sort of financial wealth effects on consumption. Uh, I am among the sinners uh, who have contributed to that literature. Uh, the, the, the sort of typical result um, that appears in my papers and others is that uh, housing wealth effects, um, if I might be allowed to use that term, look like they're much larger than uh, financial market wealth effects. But the crucial problem is that um, in large part, I think, what is measured as a housing wealth effect 
is actually an effect of the, you know, if your house prices go up, then uh, you can borrow more against the availability of that extra equity. And so it has a lot to do with the uh, availability of credit that is loosened up by the increase in house prices. And so, again, in order to really get a firm handle on that question, we need much better micro data. Yeah, it, uh, so one issue is maybe um, the volatility of uh, the savings data might it be, have my, I don't know if it increased or not, um, with um, the increase in credit availability such that it, you'd get an indirect measure of, of the fact that, yeah, maybe people are uh, impatient, but they also get nervous when they start loading up their balance sheet with debt. And when there is a shock to the system, all of a sudden that overshoot is not an overshoot. It's a reflection of the fact that now the, the, you know, when you have, you have a magnified event, uh, effect when, um, when there is an exogenous shock uh, because you, you've leveraged your balance sheet. I mean, at least in at least in the literature in institutional investing, a lot of imp, of uh, of focus is on whether balance sheets at the government, corporation, and consumer levels are are getting better. And I don't know whether, and that's a distinction between you know whether your balance sheet is getting better and how nervous you are when you have debt when there's an exogenous shock versus your expectations about your ability to earn more or less. In that same environment. Yeah, yeah. There was. Chris, uh, now you're in a policy shop. Mm -hmm. you, you've got something here in your, in your hat rack that explains history with a pretty big uh, explanatory like this. Mm -hmm. But I think the things you suggest are uh, yeah, some issues that might arise in the future. Uh, and you probably it's on the only question. Yes. Uh, how do you, which of those are the first guide do you think you can pick them into this framework or the other tools that we need to put them into the demographics and debt effects? Because to me, the reform of, of our health insurance and, and the whole spending is a big part of this actual behavior. Um, the principal thing I would say uh, on that uh, subject is uh, this paper is a bit of a departure from me in that it is the closest thing I have ever done to a, a representative agent kind of a model. Uh, it's uh, still one in which there is uncertainty, and I, I, I think that the uh, worst um, sin of the um, his trip of the sort of typical representative agent literature has been in um, just completely neglecting the role of uncertainty, but um, taking the presence of uncertainty into account, uh, it's it's you know close to a representative agent model. And my my true fundamental uh, belief is that uh, we cannot uh, really have a persuasive understanding of uh, aggregate. Uh, behavior uh, without a persuasive understanding of the heterogeneity that we see. Uh, different kinds of people do act quite differently. And for example, when you have uh, a, a stimulative uh, economic policy, um, in order to figure out, as the CBO has to do, what effects that policy will have on um, aggregate consumption, it is indispensable to know uh, whether the tax cut is going to low-income people that have a high marginal propensity to consume or to you know, rich people that um, will have a low marginal propensity to consume. Uh, the question of whether you can capture the key elements of heterogeneity just by allowing people to have different preferences, you know, different time preference rates or whatever, or whether you need further um, kinds of heterogeneity is, I think, a really interesting and important one um, that uh, we will certainly, we certainly have to deal with at the CFPB because 
there we see in our micro data just extremely different kinds of behavior for different kinds of people. And so how it is that you account for those different kinds of behavior uh, will have important implications for policies and, and, uh, and forecasts and for everything else. Okay, I think we've come to the end of the time. Yeah. Of course, yeah. We're not desperate for time. All right. One more question. Yes, I wanted to go back to balance sheets and ask you about something you didn't do, but it seems to me could be done with the, this data set and relates to your new responsibilities, and that is one thing that a household does when they have access to more credit is spend more on consumption. The other is buy assets and leverage. Have you looked at all at uh, the extent to which increased credit availability increases leverage and therefore the vulnerability to the kinds of shocks that we've seen? Um, not, not in this paper. Um, the earlier paper that I briefly alluded to uh, a minute ago um, was actually a model of um, purchases of, of houses. It was really sort of about housing. Um, and it um, did find that, you know, if you make credit more available, um, that the consequence is uh, people do go out and buy, you know, larger amounts of, uh, of you know, larger houses, basically. Uh, and lever themselves up in order to do so, and that um, to the response to uh, uh, Amir's uh, no Atif's question uh, earlier, uh, the 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 economy with the higher leverage ratio and the higher assets um, is more cyclical. It's more vulnerable to shocks. It, it responds more, you know, in, in a more sort of excited way when some bad thing happens. So. Um, yeah, very sympathetic to that. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the questions. And we move on to the next question. Uh, next paper.